Hello, and uh, thank you for joining us. Welcome from me, Michael Scott, uh, currently in France, but shortly to return to Oxford, and from my joint convener, Sanford J. Ungar in Washington, D.C., to the 34th jointly promoted event between the Future of the Humanities Initiative and the Free Speech Project. The latter is sponsored by Georgetown University and the former by Georgetown's Humanities Initiative in association with Campion Hall, Oxford, and the Las Casas Institute for Social Justice at Blackfriars Hall, Oxford. Together, the two projects consider issues concerning human dignity, rights, cultures, histories, traditions, and freedoms in a wide spectrum of educational activity, policy, expression, and aspiration. In a moment, I'll hand over to Sandy, who is the director of the Free Speech Project. He will introduce today's distinguished guests and moderate the ensuing discussion before I return to chair the question and answer session. Now for that session, we'd like you to send in your questions, please. To do so, will you use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen? The Q&A button, please, not the chat button. These questions will come to me during the session and I will try to put them to the panel to consider. We urge you, please, to ask questions as and when they occur to, to you so that we don't get a bottleneck at the end. I'm really looking forward to, uh, to today's discussion. We've got a great, uh, a great panel lined up for you. And with that, I hand over to Sandy. Thank Sandy. you very much, Mike. We are returning once again to the 70th of the war in Ukraine, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and its ongoing aftermath, uh, because our uh, participants and, and our panelists and uh, people who follow these programs have expressed ongoing interest, and many of them ultimately watch these programs online, on YouTube and other websites. So we end up with, uh, in some cases, thousands of viewers who uh, who continue to be interested in these analyses in general, but especially of uh, the, the Ukraine-Russia situation and how much we really know about it. I think the uh, panel we've assembled today has very interesting and special perspectives on it. Let me begin by introducing Anna Blackman from the University of Glasgow, where she is a lecturer on uh, Catholic religious education. Michael Kimmage, Professor of History at Catholic University in Washington, Department Chair of the History Department there. And uh, Michael is Chair also of the Advisory Council of the Kennan Institute at the Woodrow Wilson Center for International Affairs in Washington. The Kennan Institute, named for the late George Kennan, diplomat, scholar, uh, focuses particularly on Russian affairs. And so it's often a repository we go to for deep knowledge about, about Russia. Uh, David Jones, Member of Parliament, Conservative Member of Parliament from a constituency in Wales. He has been in the House of Commons for 18 and a half years, and I think uh, knows a great deal about the uh, strength of support for Ukraine in the United Kingdom and whether this is something that people have to worry about or, or think deeply about. And also Ian Linden, who is a visiting professor at St. Mary's University in London, where he teaches about social justice. So I, I'd like to begin by uh, asking what's changed. You were not the same uh, group of people who talked about this with us lately, but what's changed since the Wagner group seemingly collapsed, although I'm not sure we all know the last word or have seen the last of the Wagner group. But certainly the death of Yevgeny Prigozhin in an air crash that was widely suspected to be engineered by the Russian authorities um, seems to have certainly change the picture. But what difference has that made? Is that uh, we thought that it would weaken the Russian side in the war, and yet the Ukrainian side seems to be in stalemate. So... Uh, Michael, do you have some insights on that for us, Michael Kimmage? Sure. Uh, and first of all, thank you so much for the invitation to speak with this 
uh, this group and to address this audience, sort of the current audience and the future one that will come to us uh, virtually. Uh, I think that you can make two slightly separate points about where things are uh, in Russia. The first, I think, is probably the more important point, which is that with the military effort, you know, whatever chaos Prigozhin brought to Russia on the 24th of June and whatever chaos his death or assassination may bring, uh, it's not changed anything fundamental about the Russian war effort. In a sense, Prigozhin had already rendered his service by taking the city of Bakhmut and probably was more integral to Russian activities in Africa than he was uh in, on the battlefield in Ukraine, at least by the summer of, of 2023, that the basic structures uh, that enable Russia to, to continue its war uh, and to prosecute are still there uh, and will be there with or without uh, Prigozhin and certainly Putin's intent to continue on with the war is, if anything, perhaps a bit stronger than it was at the beginning uh, of, this, of the summer. So the big picture has not changed. Uh, and there was a temptation, I think I myself fell victim to this, to overinterpret uh, Prigozhin's mutiny and to look for cracks in the edifice, uh, they may, that may not have been there. Uh, at the same time, I think that there's a variable that Prigozhin identified, this would be my second point, uh, and this is a kind of slow boil of discontent of soldiers at the front, Russian soldiers at the front, uh, and perhaps with the larger war effort within Russian society. This is very difficult to judge from the outside, but not only was Prigozhin able to mount a mutiny of the kind he did in June, but it seemed like it was greeted with a degree of warmth by the people on the streets of Rostov-on-Don. Uh, and the Russian elite didn't particularly rally around the figure of Putin this uh, summer. So it may not be cracks in the edifice. Maybe we need a, another metaphor. But there is something boiling, perhaps, under the surface. Uh, perhaps it's there with the soldiers. Perhaps it's in the general population. Uh, and I think that that evokes a kind of tolling of a political bell for Putin, uh, that all of this may not go on forever. Anyone else have any thoughts about that? Um, uh, well, David, I, I, I think we should turn to you because you were actually in the House of Commons today, I believe, and there was an initiative to uh, ban people affiliated with the Wagner Group from the United Kingdom. Is that is that right? Well, well indeed, and in the last 10 minutes, the House of Commons has voted to proscribe uh, Wagner as a terrorist organization. Um, so it, this broadcast is perhaps timely. Um, but but really, uh, I'd like to follow on from, from what Michael was saying. Um, Prigozhin's intervention in June was really quite extraordinary. Um, he had been extremely provocative over the uh, previous few months. He'd been more or less personally offensive to the Russian defense minister, Shoigu, and uh, also to Medvedev, the, 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 the prime minister. Uh, marching on Moscow was an extraordinary thing. Uh, and of course, uh, what was even more extraordinary was when he abandoned his, his attempt to overthrow Putin, Putin did apparently didn't immediately have him arrested and shot. Um, he's apparently now been assassinated um, according to recent reports from a, a Russian analyst, he is not dead, but he's living on the island of Margarita in Venezuela. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it just sort of exemplifies what Churchill said about Russia, uh, which was that it's a, a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma um, and nothing really changes. I, from my own perspective, um, I, I would think that the loss of uh, Prigozhin, despite the fact that he was so disruptive, must have come as a loss to Putin also. For a start, the Wagner forces were probably among the most effective forces uh, in the um, in the Donbass. Uh, and uh, arguably, they saved Putin's bacon on more than one occasion. Also, of course, the very fact that uh, that Prigozhin uh, mounted this attempted coup highlighted that um, Putin is not invincible. He's very far from invincible. Uh, he is actually uh, quite vulnerable. Uh, and uh, I think that really we, we, we just, we're still seeing playing out uh, the consequences of uh, Prigozhin's um, intervention and arguable subsequent death. I think there's a lot more to come and probably in the immediate future too. I feel I should uh, 
interrupt you for a second here to just ask whether you think it's true that he's actually living alive and living on an island in Venezuela. I think it's probably unlikely. The, the, the Russian analyst in question has got a reputation for being a bit of a conspiracy theorist. Um, on the other hand, um, who knows? <laughs> well, that would certainly uh, send all the intelligence agencies into a recalculation of things if they, <laughs> your earlier conclusions were wrong. Mm -hmm. um, Anna Blackman, from your perspective, and you focus on, especially on religious affairs, uh, do you see any new prospects and any new basis for negotiation toward a uh, some kind of settlement in, in this war? Um, I mean, I, I suppose I was just thinking sort of in, in light of what people were saying about Prigozhin. I think one thing that is significant about it um, in terms of when, when we are thinking about um, uh, sort of civil resistance and, and this sort of thing, the breaking up of or, or loyalty shifts within military, I think, is really important. And that does suggest some undermining of authority, or at least there are some forms of resistance. And whether that can be spread, I think the answer is probably, as Michael was saying, I feel perhaps I was being overly hopeful about it, but I think perhaps we just don't quite know the situation. Um, in terms of negotiation, probably things like that it increase internal pressure when there is dissidence I think um especially uh within such close allies um in terms of religious negotiation is that kind of what more what you're asking about or sort of the presence of religious yes orders? there's been there's been talk about some sort of since diplomacy seems mm -hmm. to have failed is there something in the religious domain that that might be done to lead people to to meaningful and and uh, important negotiations. Yeah. Um, so I think, from my perspective, I think if we're thinking about does religion have to have a part to play in politics, I think I I want to say definitely yes. <laughs> in terms of having this shared common vision for life and how how we work together, I think probably a couple of reasons why it is important in this situation. So I think in the first instance, the signs of this already happening. So for example, Orthodox clerics who've, who've been speaking out um, against the war, um, instances of parish priests um, saying sermons, uh, condemning the war within Russia. Um, and I think there has been some attempts at mobilization as well. So I know um, have been international, uh, into religious uh, peace missions to Ukraine to try and also work with non-civil resistance there. I think um, there are uh, historically evidences as well of uh, religion being used as a mobilizing factor. So if we look at um, solidarity within Poland, that's a really good example of religion being used to mobilize civil actors. So I think there definitely is potential there. Um, in terms of a larger kind of, uh, maybe if we're thinking about religious leaders, um, another example that I was thinking about today was uh, the role that John the Twenty Third had in the Cuban Missile Crisis. So trying to speak to both sides to de-escalate the conflict, perhaps not necessarily. Uh, I think Pope Francis has been quite careful in his language of. Uh, trying to advocate for peace without necessarily using uh, particularly um, sort of condemning language on, on either side, even though it's clear that he, he does support the Ukrainians' uh, right to self-defence. So I wonder if that sort of negotiation could be a way forward. And I do think that religious leaders do have a quite a unique role to play there, actually, um, in be being able to sort of be in the political sphere, but slightly outside of it. In uh, to change the subject a bit, um, there's a lot of talk now about um, the West, even though it does not have troops on the ground, so far as we know, or not authorized in, in Ukraine, 
the West beginning to tire of this war and some, I don't know if it's fair to say loss of nerve, but, but some more ambivalence about whether uh, the Ukrainian side will ever prevail. Uh, Donald Trump, for one, whose name seems to be mentioned in every such discussion again, um, it seems clear with his, maybe he's not rising in the polls anymore, but he's still well ahead of all other Republican candidates for next year's presidential nomination. It's well known that he is an admirer of Putin's and he's lukewarm about the Ukrainian war. So does that, uh, and uh, while others may not find it imaginable, he is a serious possibility to be reelected president of the United States. So what are the implications of things like that? And is there a parallel track at all in the United Kingdom? Well, I'd like to, if I, if, if I may answer that, but just if I could just carry on and, and switch back to one of the former questions, because I'd like to make some sure. comment, is if that's all right. I think I mean the thing I think the first thing to say is that the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the United States, uh, uh, General Mark Milley, was calling in November, first of all, fairly clearly, and then in a more muted way, because he got wrapped on his knuckles over it, for consideration of negotiation. Um he he even he even compared the possibilities in Ukraine to those of what happened in the First World War, giving the example that if you'd negotiated early in the First World War, you would have had a million casualties. And as it was, you ended up with 20, with, with 20 million. And I think somebody like the Joint Chief speaking out like that is very important because on the whole, public opinion, media, and so on, normally dismiss anybody that stands up and sort of talks about negotiation as naive. You're naive or if or you're being sort of religious and and and, and living in a different sort of a world. Well joint chiefs of staff are not on the whole I would describe as naive, certainly not if you've reached that rank and you've survived being appointed by Trump and going on to work for Biden, which seems to me to be quite an incredible achievement in its own in its own right. Um, the, the the second thing uh, second thing I'd like to say is just tracking back very one sort of quick quickie on Prigozhin. He's a mercenary, and the mercenaries I've met in both in London and in Africa tend to be fantasists. And quite frankly, trotting up the road with with a few soldiers and shooting down a few airplanes on the way to Moscow is a, is the act of a fantasist. Getting on an airplane in Moscow without having every sniffer dog with, for about a hundred miles sniffing around your aeroplane in your luggage, you know, what head of state would, would go anywhere near an aeroplane without having the sniffer dogs over it? It's, it's, it's fantasy. It, 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 anyway, get, getting back to Anna's, getting back to Anna's contribution, I think it is, I, I think that the, the role of people like Pope Francis and say the Franciscans who internationally have done quite a lot of work, the role of organizations like Peace News in giving very accurate uh, information about stuff that if you were to say it yourself in the mass media, all hell would break loose and you'd be trolled into, into oblivion also. I think I think all of that's very important. And, and Anna, Anna's right, the Pope's played a very, very difficult hand given the tradition of the papal diplomatic corps as mediators in trying to 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 present themselves as neutrals which would which is absolutely essential in a way uh, for having any mediating credibility and because of that he said things like um to youth he said things like about the the great great mother russia and 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 the russian cultural heritage and has been thoroughly upbraided for it as as being a foolish and 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 an inappropriate remark despite the fact as as anna said it's perfectly obvious that that the criminal aggression and war crimes of 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 um of russia are, are completely recognized by by the vatican so i i think it it, it is it is an it is an important role but i think it's made much, much more difficult by the interaction between uh, 
the Russian Orthodox Church and Putin and Putin's way of manipulating Russian Orthodoxy to be, as it were, the the cement in the in the absence of communism in 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 of from the Soviet Union. And I remember being in Moscow and talking to Gorbachev's advisors, religious advisors, and them saying, "What will we do now? We've lost." communist uh, ethics, communist morality, in inverted commas, I thought. And uh, they were looking at for some religious sort of answer to that, or perhaps the Russian Orthodox. And I, and I remember saying to them, no, you know, lots and lots of Pentecostal churches will, will move in. You won't, you, the, 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 you cannot expect the Christian church. But he went on it, clearly to want to, as it were, get the, the Russian military officers much more involved with and they're sent to russian orthodox monasteries uh, around mount uh, arafat and 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 spend time there as it were brushing up uh, on on russian orthodox piety i think that the fact that you have kirill who is a kgb asset and is is is, is clearly completely compromised um as a part of that whole story as well as thoroughly um thoroughly strongly resisting as it were russian orthodox is a bit of a problem for the role of the church and the catholic church has always been not exactly a top priority for russian regimes i mean the catholic church has had a pretty hard time there in the past and if i may there is of course an historical precedent because um at the tehran conference um churchill uh, asked stalin to consider the stance of the pope and the Pope uh, and Stalin famously replied, how many divisions has the Pope got? Mm -hmm. uh, to which Churchill said to an aide, this man has completely lost contact with, with reason. Um, <laughs> he, he simply, Stalin simply didn't understand the importance of the Pope and the Catholic Church. And it's probably uh, a mistake that Vladimir Putin will repeat. So, Ian, I don't know if you want to come back to my other question, prematurely asked, perhaps, about... Uh, oh, sorry, did I forget that? <laughs> a, a weakening of resolve. I, I'm going yes. to everyone's comments about this. Yes, yes. Weakening of resolve in the West, which I think is um, a, a very important factor at this stage. If uh, Zelensky is going to hold people together and and keep going and, and continue to project this... Uh, albeit damaged optimism optimism nonetheless yeah i th i think it's imp i think it's very important for the resolve to be firm with as much international coherence i mean we've got hungary sort of dithering around and not exactly being very helpful in europe and we've got the republicans probably now moving much more into an isolationist what are we doing in this sort of funny place over there in the yeah. And I, so I think that does need to, obviously, but I'm sure Michael Kimmage would, would agree, and it does need to be countered fairly, fairly strongly. But I think we do need to take into account that that also would make the possibility of negotiation move up from absolutely sort of zero at the moment, as it looks, to, to some degree of possibility. And, and the other thing is a bit of memory. March 22nd, 2022 they were very near an agreement and it was basically scuppered by by Johnson and 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 the Biden government not wanting the the not wanting the Ukrainians to go down that road at that moment and of course by the Butcher um, massacres but they if you looked at it the 10-point plan and and the, the the idea that you would you would exchange um, security guarantees from the United States and Britain and so on. And it was the, the unwillingness of the British and I think the United States to give security guarantees um, on, in the belief that Russia wouldn't honor them that was that was behind them, behind it. But at that point, at that point, the Ukrainians were willing to put Crimea on the back burner, which of course is something that is very much on the front burner for the for, for for Russia, so there was a possibility there, and and it it, it was lost, and very almost immediately afterwards, the, you had the annexation of the 
the regions in 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 eastern in in eastern Ukraine. And since then, of course, I think it's negotiation has become increasingly difficult, particularly because Ukraine now bans any negotiation by decree. And um, I mean, it's not all sweetness and light. Uh, that uh, an interesting, a, a new thing, I would say, not particularly new, but quite recently, Putin has been saying, you know, how can we do negotiations if 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 it's banned by by Ukraine. And he did call upon the Ukrainians to lift the ban on negotiation to see, you know, what what could be what could be possible. Uh, now it sounds as if I'm being naive again. You know, it's it's very difficult to talk <laughs> that talk and walk that walk of without being accused of not recognizing that Putin's a monster. <laughs> Michael, sorry. <laughs> Yes, um, Michael Kimmich, maybe you could pick up some of these. Would, would be three quick points in response to the question about sort of Western resolve vis-a-vis -vis re uh, Western fatigue. Uh, and the first is that if you look only at policymakers, the story of the war is very clear. Uh, and it's an accelerating degree of support for uh, Ukraine. The F-16s are going to come at some point. I think that that's pretty clear. Uh, and if you look at where the West was at the beginning of the conflict, Every few months, a new threshold has been passed in terms of the sophistication uh, of the weaponry. And I would assume that that trend is going to continue far into the future. So I think that's probably the most important point to make, that for people with decision-making power, it's not mm. less support for Ukraine than you see, uh, it's more. Uh, and I really doubt that that's going to change anytime soon. So the second point is that even in places where you've had elections that have sort of gone a little bit outside the foreign policy mainstream, so this would be Italy and Sweden most recently, once the people who are elected come into power, they behave as mainstream European or sort of Western politicians on the subject of Ukraine. I think Maloney would be the most interesting instance of this. And of course, Hungary, uh, which Ian already mentioned, is a kind of outlier. But at the same time, they've won concessions from the European Union because of, of being an outlier. They haven't changed the policies of the European Union toward Ukraine or the policies of, uh, of European countries. So even the countries that are sort of not fully on board end up being on board uh, in practice. And I also don't think that this is gonna change anytime soon. But the third point would take us in a somewhat different direction. And this is what you could describe as kind of rising far right sentiment, especially in Germany where the AFD is polling over uh, 20%. And you see this as a Europe wide trend. You know, The Spanish election recently sort of underscored this even though the far right didn't come into power uh, there. But there too, the trend line is pretty uh, clear, uh, and I think it's obvious in the U.S. that for the Republican candidates, it's not just Trump, the Ukraine skeptic who's popular, but it's also Ramaswamy and DeSantis, are the two next most popular politicians, yeah. also among the most Ukraine skeptical of all the Republican candidates. So that's an important uh, data point. And very finally, when it comes to politics, I think the challenge of Western supporters for Ukraine is to maintain support for Ukraine without a theory of victory. And that's going to be very, very hard to do. Uh, it's not to mm -hmm. say that it's worthwhile or that the principles and the kind of imperatives aren't there when it comes to Ukraine, in my opinion, they are. But as a matter of practical politics, long wars without a theory of victory, you just go into recent American history in this regard, are not easy to maintain. Sandy, also, it's not just a question of resolve. There's some very practical military issues involved in the sense yeah. that there isn't enough, apparently, I was reading, not enough 150 millimeter shells available. So the net result is that the United States has had to resort to sending fragmentation bombs and things of that sort, which, you know, are I, I don't well, God, I don't think the United States has signed the agreement, so I can't say that it's uh, it's illegal for them, but certainly, and we're we're now sending armor-piercing you you uh, uranium type uh, shell shells, anti-tank shells, which which cause the most terrible uh, havoc in in Afghanistan with. There are lots of people, it's now thought, you know, suffering from cancer as a result of it and other, other, dis, and other disorders. We are at, in certain areas, I think, that's hardly being publicised, at the bottom of the barrel, literally, in terms of military ordnance. And um, I think that equally is the case with the Russians. I mean, why, why have we got this sort of uh, uh, visit from, from, um, from Korea? It's presumably because Korea can shovel some of its military audience in the direction of Russia in return for, for some, so, some information on how to get its guided missiles more, its, its, uh, its telemetry more effective. 
Yeah, I, I must say that scenario of Putin meeting with Kim Jong Un is a highly unlikely one that anyone might have predicted. And I don't know whether it's uh, taken seriously as a sign of, of uh, spreading support for Russia or if it's a sign of desperation and the only place to turn. I, I, I don't think the jury is in on how to interpret that. David, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, it, it looks very much to me as if um, Putin is running out of ordnance. Uh, we know that uh, North Korea has got a huge stockpile of ordnance. A lot of it is very old. A lot of it is probably very unreliable. Um, but nevertheless, they are in a position to feed it to, to Putin. Um, I actually think that this particular development is extremely dangerous because uh, we, we've seen that uh, Kim Jong-un has been trying for some considerable time to find a reliable way of uh, delivering the nuclear weapons that he apparently has got. Um, Russia, of course, uh, has got the, the rocket technology. It's interesting that they've met uh, at a, a, a rocket base uh, about 500 miles away from Vladivostok. Um, and, you know, frankly, two unstable uh, heads of state uh, talking to each other about how best to prosecute a war uh, in, in Europe and how best to arm uh, the other against uh, its, its enemies or perceived enemies in the Far East strikes me as a recipe for uh, considerable danger. And I think it's something we should be concerned about. And then let's go back to this question of uh, popular support or, or uh, reliable uh, endorsement by members of the public of this Western strategy, not sending troops, apparently, but <clears throat> sending weaponry and diplomatically supporting Ukraine. You're in Glasgow. I don't know if you're there at the moment, but you spend a fair amount of your time in Glasgow. And uh, do you think there is support at that distance from Westminster, is there support for this government policy of, of backing the Ukrainians? Yeah, I think, I think that's a good question. I, I think I, I think there's probably, I was, and I actually was going to, going to ask Michael about this, I think, and, and maybe David knows a bit more, but I can see two sides to it. I think on the one side, they're definitely is support in terms of um I, th I think fear of um russia and keeping the war contained within ukraine perhaps so supporting the war efforts there but i do wonder and i don't think i don't think i know the answer to this but i do wonder um how much um it support there is in terms of i, th I think here and probably america people dealing with economic um fallout from it um and uh sort of economic hardship and in increasing as as the war continues and especially with elections coming up whether that is uh in, in, i suppose creating some sort of fatigue with the situation um i think probably the other issue to think about in terms of glasgow is uh nuclear weapons so trident being being based in fast lane and there is a lot of uh um antagonism around that uh, the nuclear weapons base being based in in scotland um so i think that's, that's really a factor that's not that hasn't been mentioned and hasn't been in the that i've mm -hmm. seen in the media and discussions of this yeah. and that, that is an interesting Certainly interesting point to raise. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Michael Kimmage, I, I was a little surprised by your certainty over American support. Um, after all, there is there is this presidential election looming in, in just in, in less than 14 months now. And uh, early November next year does are you are you confident that come what may politically American military support will be there 
Well, not entirely. Um, you know, obviously Trump is a great wild card, uh, and he's claimed that he could resolve the crisis in 24 hours if he were given the chance, which sounds a lot to me like he would concede uh, to Russian terms uh, in, a, in a negotiated settlement, which wouldn't certainly equal sustained uh, military support. But I would put the point this way. I think the United States is contradictory on the subject of Ukraine. I don't think that the general population at this point cares all that much. It sounds a little bit maybe impolite to put it in those terms, but other issues have come in. It's no longer getting the media attention it did uh, at the beginning of the conflict, and the sort of slightly interminable quality to it is, um, I think, inducing a lot of Americans uh, to tune out. And the great political risk for the Biden administration or for anybody else who's going to be in power is that the Ukraine conflict turns to resemble the conflict in Afghanistan, uh, just sort of psychologically. If that's the case, then the U.S. is going to start to really question what it's doing in Ukraine and may move in a different direction. But I don't think any American politician is going to want to own, quote unquote, losing Ukraine. And I think that that includes Donald Trump. After all, when Trump is in power, his first term, despite a lot of the noises he made on the campaign trail, he's the one who provides lethal military assistance to Ukraine. Under his watch, two new countries enter the NATO alliance. Military spending of, you know, U.S. military spending on Europe goes up. Under Trump, it doesn't go down. I don't even think Trump, who might be all over the map, would be all over the map rhetorically when it comes to Ukraine, is going to be the one who wants to hand Ukraine over to uh, to Russia. So that's a built-in constraint, even if the election goes away from the Democrats uh, in 2024, and suggests to me that probably the U.S. will be where it is for the foreseeable future in terms of support to Ukraine. It's interesting. Just to interject here, um, I live quite near the Russian embassy in, D in, in, in Washington, D.C., and I remember when the Russians first invaded Ukraine when there were 100,000 Germans on the street protesting the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And they were, there was plenty of rhetoric in the United States, but there were virtually no demonstrations outside the Russian embassy. And it's not that people don't know where it is. Um, and I, that always made me think just on the basis of totally unscientific neighborhood observation, made me wonder whether there was really, uh, you know, whether there was deep support in the United States, other than, of course, in areas where Ukrainian immigrants or people of Ukrainian ethnic uh, origins live in certain cities in the Midwest, et cetera. Um, I, I, did, I was always suspicious of the strength of American support for it, and, and that it could be sort of easily knocked out. And I just wonder, are some of the in, in in the UK is there any kind of similar phenomenon? Have there been big outpourings, dramatic outpourings that the government had to notice? David, I don't know if you want to comment on. That. Yeah, I I think so. Um, I, I can't recall many uh, demonstrations recently. There certainly were demonstrations in support. Uh, at the beginning of the conflict. Um, and I think wherever, wherever you travel right across the UK, you'll see that houses are flying Ukrainian flags, which is you know quite unusual for this country because unlike the US, we, we tend not to fly flags and wave them. We, it's, it's not really terribly British, but- We wave but, flags a lot. Generally. I know you do, but but uh, but we don't, but, but we've made a, a strong exception in the case of Ukraine. Uh, my perception is that there is still a, a strong level of support in the United Kingdom for uh, Ukraine and particularly for President Zelensky, who uh, is, is a charismatic leader and who, who appeals does, to a lot of Brits. He gets still a lot of a lot of ink in the United States and a lot of a lot of attention. Um, Ian, just briefly. If you were an advisor to President, oh, and let me say one thing before we go any further, that if people uh, who are tuning into this program have questions, now would be an excellent time to put them into the Q&A link. Uh, we'll be coming back to Mike Scott in a, just a few minutes to, to pick those up. So this would be a good time to add any questions that our participants might, might have. But Ian, if you were an advisor to um, President Zelensky, um, he's had a couple of things that are a little difficult politically to handle. Corruption in the military, in Ukraine, people buying out of bribing 
their way out of the obligation to serve, um, some suppression of media attention domestically. And we don't really know how much access uh, visiting correspondents have within Ukraine to this war. But what would, what would you advise Zelensky right now if he asked you, Ian, how do I keep Western support? What what do I have to do in this shaky time? And I dare say British as well as American politics, although David might not agree with that. But um, I think hmm, I think the real problem for Zelensky is that he's in a way trapped in in a, a, a very difficult situation. On the one hand. He's had to present to NATO countries where he needs the, 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 the military equipment and arms and so on, a, a, a position which is absolutely solid, no retreat, no letting Crimea sort of have be put on the back burner for 15 years, as in the original agreement, a complete, a complete shutdown, as it were, on any type of concessionary nego negotiation. Whereas privately, he must know that he can't win this war. I mean, I, I, the, the, some of the sort of advisors in that have said that he's, he's expressed the wish to negotiate, but saying, if I try to negotiate, I'm dead meat. You know, I've got, I'm gone as far as popular support is concerned and his political position within the country. So I think the first thing to sort of say in answer to your question is you have to recognize that's where he is. He's he's in an in, a, in, a, in an incredibly difficult position. So I suppose the advice I would give would be to try and move back from the the, the heroic we will fight to the last sort of Ukrainian type of thing to keep our country uh, and move back from that slightly and 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 at the same time edge forward a little bit in private um, if it's possible on on the negotiating negotiating front as in as in the as in the original agreement that they were nearly reaching in in 20 in 2022 because you know as the american generals sort of recognize you know all wars have to end and they end in two ways either in the complete destruction of the country the war is taking place in as in as in afghanistan or or in in um in some sort of negotiated settlement uh, well, as there are many people, an increasing number of people, I'd say, uh, another winter coming, et cetera, that uh, this war will end when Vladimir Putin decides it's over, mm. not, not when things really change on the ground. And if, if indeed Putin is somewhat weakened politically, um, then he might need not to decide that the war in Ukraine is over. Yeah, but I mean, there's this, I think a lot of people reading about the war think, ah, the next bit of military equipment, the F-16s or whatever it is, that when they arrive, that will turn everything. Well, it won't. It'll just give more equality of air power, basically. It's not going to completely change the the, the story. And And when you think of the capacity of say China or North Korea and the huge population of, of Russia which Putin is willing to sacrifice in in, in this thing I, it, it is an unwinnable war I think it has That's to be said the... though, I think that the um, Russian people are themselves becoming very fatigued with, with yes. this conflict yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> the, the, a, a lot of Russians particularly wealthy Russians, have actually fled the country already. Yes. Uh, we're, we're, we're seeing the spectacle of people openly expressing concern, asking uh, why their men, menfolk, and it is largely menfolk, are mm. still being sent to the front to, their, to, to what appears to be their yeah. death. Uh, calculations are that over 100,000 Russian soldiers have lost their lives and many more have been injured. Yes. So Putin, although he's a in a strong position, is not completely invulnerable. 
Uh, and at some stage, uh, public pressure, I would have thought, in Russia may well assert itself. So although certainly, as you say, uh, in um, Zelensky has got some pretty careful calculations to make, I think so has Putin, because um, he, 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 he is not there indefinitely. I do Frank agree with you, but the, the, casual, I mean, the casualties on the Ukrainian side, um, we don't really know, do we? Because obviously they're not being publicized but it's pretty clear that they're taking very heavy very heavy casualties in this attempt That's absolutely to break true. through and and that can't just go on indefinitely without some sort of sense it within the country that um we're not getting anywhere very much you know taking a kilometer a, a month sort of thing and taking the sort of casualties you you could get that beginning to rear its head within within ukraine what you're describing in russia uh, Michael Kim, is just before we turn back to Mike Scott for a uh, discussion of the questions that have come in. At the Kennan Institute, you surely have access to, if there's a think tank concerned with Russia that people will sit up and listen to, that's the one. And yeah. so uh, how do you evaluate uh, Putin's options at this point? Well, I would say that the situation is such that both countries are in for a very long war. Uh, I think the reason that Ukraine can't really negotiate, and I would very politely disagree with Ian about the prospects of negotiations in the first couple of weeks of the war, I don't think that they were especially bright for Ukraine. Uh, the reason that it's near impossible for Ukraine to negotiate in a way that would end the war uh, has to do with the radicalism of the Russian war aims. Uh, and you can see from the Russian attacks on grain to the reunification efforts uh, in occupied territories uh, of Ukraine, the attacks on civilian infrastructure. You can see how uh, all of this bespeaks a very radical project on Russia's part, which is at the very least to partition the country, uh, if not in some way to kind of dominate the territory uh, of all of Ukraine. And sort of given that Ukraine, whether or not it has Western support, has really own, only one option is to respond to the Russian invasion. Uh, with force in, in in whatever way it can. Uh, on the Russian side, uh, not only ha I think, have I think uh, uh, the objectives not moderated since the beginning of the war, I think in some ways they may even have augmented. I think what Russia has discovered is that it has many capacities to fight this war. It has the tacit support of China, not direct, but tacit. Uh, it has a kind of support from India, Brazil, South Africa, and many other sizable important countries. It's getting through roundabout trade, all kinds of smuggling that's bringing in military uh, materiel, uh, sanctioned materiel uh, into Russia. Uh, there's an art article in today's New York Times about uh, enormous munitions production uh, in Russia itself, outpacing European military production on certain kinds of ammunition uh, in a very rapid way. The Russian economy has done fine throughout the war. The sanctions haven't really dented it. And most importantly for Putin, it's a popular war. Maybe it's artificially popular, maybe it's through manipulation, maybe there's, you know, sort of something under the surface, as I was arguing at the beginning of this conversation, but for practical purposes, the war uh, is popular. So I just see a 5, 10, 15, 20 year conflict in the making where both sides have both the capacity and the motivation uh, to keep on fighting. It depresses me enormously to put this, to put the whole crisis in these terms, but that's to me where the evidence points. That's a long war. One of the things I wanted to ask you, well, not just you, Michael, but but anybody. It's this that at the beginning, the the discourse from Russia was all about the expansion of NATO and the threat this was, and having to deal with that threat. And you know, coming from the George Kennan Institute yourself, <laughs> don't have to remind you that what he said that it would be a fateful error of American policy to to engage in the expansion of 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 NATO. So, I mean, in, 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 a, in a very, very small way, the legitimation of some sort of response to the NATO advance was, was based on uh, some degree of fact. NATO had, uh, had advanced. It had, it, had, it, had, it, had, it had taken in about 10 new, new countries and it got right to the borders and so on. And there was Romania and and Austria, uh, I forget, R Romania, one other country with American missiles in, though they were defensive missiles, and 
and so on. Now it seemed to have mutated into the great imperial history being reincarnated by by Putin, which is a much more, which in, which in a way is not anything. It, it's not something that is an existential threat either to the United States or to the United Kingdom, but it's as sure as hell an existential threat to Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Georgia, and my so on. Um, you know, my, uh, 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 Ian, I'm going to interrupt you there. And before you answer that, Michael, I want to switch over to Mike Scott in Oxford, who may want to pick up those threads mm -hmm. as he goes into the questions that have come in. Well, I, I, I do think that that last question is uh, thank you, thank you, Sandy. I do think that last question is quite a, an important question there, Ian. Uh, d does anybody on the panel, David? Did you want to? Well, yes, I, I did actually, um, mm -hmm. and of course, th there is always the danger of uh, escalation through error. Uh, mm -hmm. There, there was a report last week from uh, Ukraine that um, a Russian drone had actually hit. Uh, Romanian territory. Uh, yeah. Romania, of course, is a, is a NATO uh, member state. There are RAF uh, planes based there. Uh, and it's arguable that something of that sort may be uh, a, 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 a bit more flag flagrant um, could result in the triggering of uh, Article 4 of the NATO treaty. Mm. Um, so, so, so that sort of thing is, is, is really terribly dangerous. What was quite interesting in that particular case was that immediately NATO denied that there had been uh, any strike on, on Romanian territory, notwithstanding that um, mm. Ukraine were quite clear that this drone had landed there. Um, but it, it it's a very perilous position, and um, yeah. we shouldn't rule out the prospect of uh, escalation through cock-up. Yeah. Yeah, that brings us on to one of the questions uh, that... that um... This, that's come through, which is, how do we actually know what the truth is about this war? I mean, there are two aspects to that. How do we know what the truth is by what is being reported by the media? But more importantly, how do, the, how do we know that the various governments in the West know what the truth is? How do we know that? If I can come back on that, Mike, um, you, you, governments can only make an assessment. Um, MPs get uh, regular reports from the Ministry of Defence. And what I, I would say is that the reports that we get are reflected very, very closely in the media reports that we see in the newspapers and, and on TV. Um, that's the only way that I can make an assessment, and that is that everything I hear uh, from uh, the media is actually corroborated mm -hmm. by the stuff that I'm getting from the Ministry of Defence. But I can mm -hmm. well understand that people would ask that question because, of course, you're getting conflicting propaganda coming from both Ukraine and, and from Russia. And I think that all that we can do is to try to rely upon independent assessments from, uh, for example, the, the American and British military. Mm. Michael, please, that... yes. Mm. Michael, first, and then I'll come to Ian, yeah. A comprehensive answer to your question. I just want to identify two problems when it comes to our understanding of the war. Uh, and the first is, is social media, which is um, in some ways revelatory. It brings images and videos and, and testimony very quickly to our attention, but is very skewed toward a certain kind of pro-Ukrainian story we often get it filtered through uh you know you can sort of see from the number of ukrainian flags on people's social media sites which is not an issue on an individual site but uh uh the story of the war that we get uh through social media uh comes to us through a lot of filters so we've seen thousands of russian tanks being pulled by ukrainian farmers but there are lots of other images of the war uh that we don't necessarily see through social media so it's not active manipulation but it's more that you get kind of one side of the story. And then I think a lot of Western journalists feel emotionally close to the Ukrainian people and to the Ukrainian military, which I think I would if I would be over there. I mean, we're all human beings and have a position that's no longer possible for most Western journalists to operate in Russia because of uh, the conditions there. It would be impossible, I think, to embed with Russian units uh, or at the very least very difficult for Western journalists. Uh, and so the emotions of the story come to us in wartime, 
from one particular side. And you do have to be very concerned, uh, again, not about the nature of sympathy, that's human, uh, but you have to be very concerned about accuracy uh, and putting forward the awkward detail and you know issues of corruption, perhaps in the Ukrainian military or setbacks. And as was mentioned earlier, we just don't know about casualties and a lot of key figures. It's a kind of uh, joke in Washington that you hear that people know more about the Russian military than they do about the Ukrainian military. Uh, in the course of this war, which is which is a bit perplexing, but speaks to the kind of media landscape uh, in which we're operating. Ian, you, you muted Ian. You muted. Uh, the, I mean, the quote is, that I, I looked it up actually, and it's not what we think it is, but it is actually the first casualty when war comes is truth. It's not the, the first casualty of war is truth. It's the first casualty when war comes is truth. And that is that is obviously true, and, and it's obviously a fundamental difficulty for both war correspondents and political analysts and so on, because there are certain uh, types of thing that if you say it, you're you're really quite likely to uh, have a, a quite a wide attack in the social media. In, in the past, in the sort of Vietnam War, Afghan War, you could you could lose your job with, with NBC if you if you spoke out in a particular way against um, the war or expressed yourself badly in, 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 what, in what you were saying. And I think the, 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 the loss of truth is all about omission usually, as well as, as, as sort of particularly uh, positive, well, positive propaganda about what, what, you're, what you're doing. And if you ask yourself, what's the omission? Well, I suppose it's it's as you say it'll be casualty figures from your own side. Um, I'm, I mean, I remember when the coffins were coming back from Afghanistan. No, no television company was allowed to be there as the coffins with the American flag came off the plane. I think they allowed one picture of it or maybe two pictures of it. But that's a sort of pretty, pretty fundamental thing. The other, of course, is the is the huge. I'm going to sound. I'm going to sound like a lefty now. The military-industrial complex. Um, it's the Lockheed Martins that uh, are not really written about. And I, I've discovered it was very, very interesting that there was quite a debate about the expansion of of NATO. And Bruce Jackson, who was head of Lockheed Martin, led the committee to expand NATO and lobbied the American government when there was a sort of debate about it. And we do have to, I think think of the enormous profits that the, the, the these large corporations that supply armaments are making out of this. And just bear in mind, there are plenty of people who do not wish this war to end. Well, Anna, that's, a, that's a kind of a sorry. moral issue uh, that you might like to just comment on. Mm. Yeah, I think... Um... Yeah, I think there's some really good points there. I think the, the first thing that I was thinking about as, as Ian was talking actually was um, to do with journalism and especially in Ukraine, uh, self-censorship of journalists um, and sort of journalists who've reported yeah. that they might find that there's there's corruption, but they don't want to report it because it's going to harm the war effort, all, all of these sorts of things. So I think that's, that's one uh, issue. And I suppose trying to think around that, how do we support independent voices here i think the other one um which i think again sort of uh it's back to what ian was saying about this casualty of war who's being the casualty of war i think especially in russia we might want to ask it the other way around and how does the cancellation of truth lead to violence um because when that free speech is suppressed or dissident voices are suppressed that can lead to a lot of, as we've seen, disinformation campaigns and propaganda. It's very hard then to sort of separate fact from fiction and and uh, difficult to um, sort of perhaps not buy into the narratives that you're being told. So I think that's, that's another fact. Um, and the other one that I just wanted to touch on was also this idea of conscientious objection um, or people voicing their dissent, not necessarily against one side but just against war in general and I think that can be very hard and it's often branded as being disloyal or anti-nationalist when it isn't necessarily um and and I think uh probably that we see that on both sides um and part of I think the uh, what, what's come out with the corruption in Ukraine is uh people sort of paying 
people in the military to be taken over the border or not not to go into war and part of that I think tells us about the trauma of it not wanting to be part of this and what are those voices when we sort of think about what those voices are telling us um uh perhaps the ones that aren't being highlighted I don't know don't know if anyone wants to pick up on that or cluster bomb story you know actually sending cluster bombs when you see what the, what cluster bombs did to to Kosovo and Bosnia and so on and and the years and years it takes and the children with legs blown off you know years after the like, cluster bombs have been fired against the enemy I mean there is a real moral issue there it seems to me within military practice but there's also there's also I think something that I find very, very difficult, but we've seen it played out more in Latin America. And that is the moral jeopardy of allowing war crimes to go unpunished. But very often that's the price of peace. And I, I, I think that's an enormously difficult thing and be very, very difficult for the Ukrainians to actually have to pay that price. Like, I think that would be quite a, and the war crimes are so severe. <laughs> in this, well, they are in all worlds, but it, it's, it's particularly bad, isn't it? I don't know what you think about that, but South Africa was very interesting in that, had a truth commission, but chances of truth commissions in Russia is completely for the birds. Of course, a, a warrant has been issued for the arrest of Vladimir Putin for... Exactly, uh, exactly, exactly. Um, I don't know how long that'll take to be executed. <laughs> yeah. mm. um, another question that came in. It was a bit earlier on when it said, um, did Russia have any legitimate right at all uh, to uh, to invade? I mean, was it was it just uh, Vladimir Putin deciding that, that he wanted to be some kind of hero and so on and, and reclaim lost uh, lost lands and so on? Was there any legitimacy, though? Uh, felt within Russia, amongst people in Russia, that that this was a necessary thing to do. Yes, please, Michael. I think there are two answers to the question, sort of a philosophical answer, and then as you're as you're asking about Michael, a, a kind of uh, you know practical answer from a Russian point of view, as best as we can. Uh, understand it. I think philosophically speaking, there's no justification for the war. Ukraine posed no threat to Russia. There was no danger in which Russia uh, was in uh, in the years before uh, the war. And, you know, we could devote a whole hour and 15 minutes to talking about NATO uh, and NATO enlargement, NATO expansion. Yeah. Uh, you know, the simple fact is that Ukraine was not um, slated for NATO expansion. Uh, although statements had been made in that direction, a lot of the diplomacy had been bungled. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think if Russia had stood down in February 2022 instead of invading, they probably could have gotten a kind of promise from France and Germany and maybe even from the U.S. that Ukraine would never become a part of, uh, of NATO. So if that was the issue, which is the one that Putin has put forward, in addition to a lot of fabulous issues such as Ukrainians committing genocide against Russians in the Donbass, you know, there were other ways of handling it than uh, by going to war. So I, I, I can't see any sort of justification for what Russia has done, let's say, in our terms, uh, as opposed to Putin's terms, or maybe more generally Russian terms. But it has been a popular war. Uh, and that does tell us something about Russian attitudes toward Ukraine, toward the United States, toward Europe. Uh, that's, uh, of course, significant. But the reason I find it so complicated to judge on the Russian side, you know, Russia being now a dictatorship, and so the will of the chief executive matters so greatly there, I do think that if Russians had had the choice on the 23rd of February, 2022, to go to war in Ukraine or not, I think 95% of Russians would have said no. I don't think that there was a okay. movement in Russia to go to war on the eve of the war. Now, once the war begins, you have a rally around the flag effect, you have anti-anti-war yeah. sentiment, you have people not wanting to lose. I can very easily understand why Russians wouldn't want to lose the war. Most Americans didn't want to lose the war in Vietnam either, even if they came to object to it or feel that it was an immoral uh, or wrong war. So we kind of are where we are now in terms of Russian public opinion, which is pro-Putin enough for Putin's sake. Uh, but the Russian story on this is a complicated one. Uh, and I think if Russia were more democratic, I don't think the war would have taken place. Yeah, I really agree David, with that. Do you? 
And David, do you do? do yes, you I do. That? I do. Yeah, I, 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 I think it's it is exactly. I think Michael's put it very, very well. Actually, that I mean, there are all these circumstances about NATO, and they they they, they provided. I mean, the, the damaging aspect of it was that it provided a very good excuse initially for it, the, however spurious. Um, but I think there was amongst the military a, a, a sort of a feeling of being surrounded. I mean, when you go back to the Kennedy days, you know, the, the deal was, you know, take your missiles out of Turkey and uh, and we'll um, and, and uh, we'll pull back from uh, the we'll pull our missiles out of Cuba. And I, I, I think the trouble is that. that if, if you're in a very Soviet mindset, you're in the back of the envelope stuff at Yalta, all about, you know, this is your sphere and this is my sphere. And and, and I think he's got that in his head, really, that that's it, that it's his sphere. And he, I mean, I I actually I was looking at the population figures for Latvia, Lithuania and and um, and Estonia. And, uh, well, you know, they're all one million, one point eight million or two million. And Latvia and and uh, Estonia, a quarter of the population are identify ethnically as Russian, and they must be in a sort of Sudetenland type of danger, really. If if as 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 a potential, but then of course that would trigger that would trigger uh, a NATO response. But and they are fearful. I mean, the Estonians are really fearful. Actually, what you mentioned there, President Kennedy, and uh, uh, Victoria Mumford Smith um, sent a question in. Do you think that President Kennedy would have handled the situation of the Russian invasion of Ukraine any differently from the present methods of the Western world? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> It, it, it's well, always, tough one, Mike. It's yeah. always extremely difficult. I mean, you know, the, the the alternative history problem. You know, you 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 really can't come up with a cogent answer. I mean, I mean, Cho En Lai w w was asked once what he thought would have happened if it hadn't been Kennedy who was assassinated, but Khrushchev, and he thought briefly, and then he said, "Well, I don't think that Aristotle Anassis would have married Mrs. Khrushchev." So <laughs> you, 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 you can't give an answer to a question like that. Yeah. Michael, Michael, yeah. I think the only answer I could give is that I don't think policy-wise Kennedy would have had different or, or new ideas relative to those that are out there with Western leadership. What Kennedy had was eloquence. And actually that's missing on the part of all the relevant figures uh, at the moment. It's certainly missing mm -hmm. in Biden. I mean, Olaf Scholz, I think, doesn't aspire to eloquence. Maybe Macron comes the kind of closest, but he's not a figure who can really give the speech to put people behind the war. So going back to Sandy's earlier questions about war fatigue, you know, one of the answers to war fatigue is just brilliant stylistic political leadership. That is not in great supply at the moment. Uh, in the West, that may be a deficit, and it may over time be a kind of costly deficit. So the kind of speech that Kennedy gave uh, in Berlin in 1963 that really kept people on board with certain policies, and uh, that's 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 not there. So in addition to Aristotle and Nessus, you know, and uh, and, uh, and 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 wonderful joke, uh, that might be uh, the meaning of Kennedy's presence if he were around today. Yeah. Yeah. Any other time? I mean, kids were saying Ronald Reagan <laughs> is famous for saying, Mr. Putin, tear down this wall. One has to wonder what he might say to Putin today in this situation. If he were, uh, I mean, there are a lot of ifs there. Well, Mark yeah. Miller has, ha, Miller has been in, he has been talking to Grasimov. I mean, there has been some sort of attempt at diffusing situations uh, at the level of the, the heads of the military. But I don't know to what extent there's any black back. I mean, the whole the whole Kennedy thing depended on back channels and and, and so on. I, I, I'm just a bit worried that they're not there in quite the same way. They may be. I mean, how, how would we know? Thank you for that. There's a, I'll give it. Actually, there's another question in which we've, we've, we've tended to uh, uh, to talk about already, but I think I think the way that uh, Sebastian de Hoek has uh, has put it is, is is interesting. How did the whole 
uh, Prigozhin murder play out. Surely a man like Prigozhin would have had some sort of life insurance, e.g. scandalous information on Putin when he negotiated the withdrawal of his troops during the march on Moscow. Did Putin manage to deactivate or is, or is it that Prigozhin was just stupid? That's stupid. <laughs> is that what you think? Stupid. stupid. Well, I, I, I do think it was, it's quite incredible, you know, under the circumstances, as I said earlier on, to get on an aeroplane and without really checking for, for bombs, uh, if, if you were in that position, uh, you know. <laughs> and that was very, very strange. Uh, yeah, I, not other, stupid. I'm not stupid. Being a fantasist is is stupid, I suppose. But he clearly is a cunning man. Uh, but 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 there's bits missing when it comes to sort of rational decisions. I, I, I think that the most remarkable uh, aspect of that episode was the fact, as I said earlier, that uh, when the march stopped, Putin didn't immediately arrest Prigozhin and um, yeah, have him yeah. shot, which is what you'd expected. Um, yeah. that, that would have underlined Putin's own strength. The fact yeah. that that didn't happen tends mm -hmm. to make me think that there was some weakness that we probably don't know about yet yeah. uh, that yes. prevented him from doing so, and that Putin had to resort to the time-honoured method of um, assassination by stealth, which is mm -hmm. what he does, um, yeah. allegedly does, to people who oppose his, his, his regime. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. I'm going to uh, hand back and ask uh, Sandy if he wants to say anything. It's coming towards the end now. Sandy, yes, do you, we're, you want to? We're pressing up against our, our deadline, but um, I want to thank everybody for this wonderful conversation. It really, um, it sort of underlines for me how little we know, as, as someone said earlier, and how this has faded from the center of dialogue discussion. Um, probably not for Michael Kimmage, given the position he's in, but for an awful lot of people, uh, I think they're saying, oh, that's still going on, is it? Anyway, thanks to all of you for your your wisdom. Um, very nice to have David Jones from coming directly from the House of Commons to, to talk about this and to have everybody giving us the time. Uh, as usual, I want to thank Georgetown University for its steadfast support of these monthly programs. I think Mike said earlier, this is our 34th one in a row since we started the series deep in the pandemic. And uh, judging from some circles, we may be in a pandemic again before too long. There's a lot of COVID. So we have to keep it going, Mike, just in case. And we will. Uh, so thank you, Mike. And thanks to everyone here at Georgetown and all the backup you have and in Oxford, Mike, for, and, and of course to oh, John you. McCabe, John McCabe here in Washington, who keeps the series going while juggling a lot of other bills here as well. Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Sandy, uh, for, for uh, keeping with this uh, with this uh, whole series. It's uh, it's been tremendous. Um, the next speech project at the Crossroads International Dialogue event in association with the Future Humanities Project will be on Wednesday the 11th of October, when we will be discussing democracy in the, U in the USA. Um, what is going on? Uh, what is happening at the moment with all the, uh, uh, what is the international response to this what do people think about it internationally um uh because every day there seems to be some news about an arrest or other um or an impeachment or other um it's just strange uh maybe to people and so we want to investigate that and, and have a look at to see what people from outside the united states might be thinking about the United States at the present time. Um, if you in the Washington area, uh, please note um, that on the 26th of September at 5 p.m. in the Riggs Library of Healy Hall, Georgetown University, there will be a guest lecture by 
Dr. Claire Broom Saunders from Blackfriars Hall at Oxford University. The inescapable lure of the medieval politics, pictures and poetics in the long 19th century. And it's interesting in terms of free speech, because what she's going to be talking about is the way that uh, writers used medieval images, chivalric images, Arthurian images and so on, to make political points as we moved into that period of the Great War and to the end of the Great War, how they were actually saying things in a kind of a code, a medieval, referring to medieval uh, icons, medieval literature and so on. I think it's a fascinating uh, fascinating subject and I hope uh, I hope you you'll come along to that if you if you're anywhere near Georgetown University 5 p.m 26th of September in the Riggs Library. My thanks to colleagues at Georgetown to the president Chuck DeJoy and to uh, Tom Banchoff, uh, a black prize to John O'Connor the uh, regent and to Richard Finn uh, the director of the Las Casas Institute, a Campion Hall to Dr Nick Austin the master of uh, Campion Hall. Thanks uh, for me also uh, to uh, to colleagues at Georgetown, in particular for John McKay for making this happen, and to those people uh, over in Oxford, including uh, Maggie, my wife, who uh, who helps administer it, this this uh, this program from our side. So, thank you, Ian, Michael, David, Anna, for a terrific conversation this afternoon, and thank you, Sandy, and thank you for tuning in and we hope that you'll tune in again on the 11th of October and if you're there uh, on the 26th of September and you've come along please introduce yourselves to us thank you very much bye-bye thank you mate bye-bye bye-bye